Hi guys, we're uh, this is our last final installment. We're coming to you, talking to you about really cool stuff here. This is going to be the last installment for today. Uh, we've got the wood field camera. This is what I promised about trying to talk about. Uh, this camera is a hundred years old. That's pretty old. It's made out of cherry or walnut. Um, what do I recommend? Seneca. That's what I started with. I started with Corona, uh, the Kodak. Kodak used to make this. Rochester optical camera made this camera. I got this from a friend of mine. I went to the um, camera shows in Atlanta, and I went to camera shows in Huntsville, Alabama, the Von Buren Civic Center. And uh, Huntsville had the largest camera show for 10 or 20 years. Thousands of people, hundreds of dealers. I mean, Peachtree Camera was there testing cameras. Anyways. This has been converted, wait till you see this, we have taken a camera that there's a speed graphics uh, lens on the front and I have gone to Colorado and we've been to uh, places like uh, Utah and we have actually learned how to refurbish these cameras to make them more modern. The lens on this camera is not the original lens. This is a speed graphic lens, it's probably a uh, 90 or 100 or 180 millimeter lens. We can't use a 35 or 50 millimeter lens because we have to have wide coverage. And if I look at this lens, it's uh, Rapex, it's um, Speed Graphics, which went on the old Speed Graphics uh, press cameras from the 1930s. It uh, has uh, f2.8 to f16, f11. It's an f4.5 lens. But I bought this at the camera shows, pretty good price, wouldn't pay a lot for the lens. Uh, I could have bought it at KEH or um, I could have bought it at um, Wings Camera Store in Atlanta, I highly recommend. These guys have all the old stuff, old film camera stuff, really good, cool stuff. We don't have Photo Barn, we don't have Showcase anymore in Atlanta, so it's kind of hard to believe that Atlanta doesn't have a professional brand new camera store anymore. But anyways, in the old days we had piece your camera to repair your cameras, we had quality camera in Smyrna. We have uh, Camera Repair Japan. So Atlanta has a lot of great people here to fix cameras. And I met them and they were friends of mine. We went to cabinet makers and we took this camera, it's 100 years old. If you look at the back of it, why do we want to do a field camera, a view camera? I went to college, I took commercial photography. You, Once you're in a film environment, you're gonna to have to learn how to use these cameras, whether you like it or not. They're difficult to use, very cumbersome, bulky. But they produce, provide a big negative, a 4x5, 5x7, 8x10. This is what Ansel Adams used when he was a photographer, doing all the national parks. What's on the back of this? This is not a 5x7 or 8x10 back. It's a 4x5 back from another camera. So we took this 4x5 camera back, and we took a cabinet maker, and he cut this down so it fit on the back of this camera. You can do the same thing. Instead of buying a Cambo or Calumet, or Weston, or Takahari, or Wood Cherry, or Walnut view cameras, wood field cameras. This is what people take out to the field, to Colorado, Utah, to take pictures of red rocks formations, and waterfalls, and gorgeous landscape photography in Colorado, and Wyoming, and the mountains of Tetons, I mean, you know, snow-covered mountains, that's what I did. And the bellows is 100 years old, it's made out of leather. You want to make sure that when you buy this, I used to buy things also, I'd recommend Shutterbug Magazine. Shutterbug Magazine had a lot of old stuff like this. But eBay and Amazon, people are selling stuff like this again. There's people making these cameras, believe it or not, made out of cherry or walnut. Now, what's the deal? Is this a view camera? Yes, it is, basically. It's a view camera for 4x5 sheet film, which this is the film holders. It has a rail on here, so it's very similar to... It'd be hard to carry a view camera around out in the woods taking pictures of landscaping. But here's the film holder. It has two different sides to it. So you basically pull the top part out, install the film, you close the door, and then you flip the other side over and you do your... This actually fits into the back of this holder. This comes apart and this comes open. I'll have to turn it around to show you. And then what happens is when you go ahead and put this on a tripod, highly recommend it, because you're using shutter speeds one second sometimes, or half a second, or you know, a quarter of a second. And you have to account also for bellows um, compensation. That means that if this bellows is extended, 
you can see in here, I can extend it, I can tilt it, I can do architecture. This was 1909, 1929, this camera was made. All-purpose camera was what it was. A Kodak Brownie or a Kodak camera that amateurs used wouldn't be what professionals wanted because they couldn't do a lot of different things. Correct for um, buildings, parallax view, that type of thing. You read up about it. But see how long the bellows is? And the bellows extend. So when you extend the bellows, you have to compensate for that. If you don't, your exposure would be off. So we use a handheld meter. And if you remember Back to the Future, in the movie Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox, he was using cameras like this. But they used glass plates. I don't use glass plates. I don't coat things with emulsion like George Eastman did when he started out. He started Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. And it was glass plates. This is a ground glass on the back. It's not hard to find these oversized. Uh, you probably pay $100 for this. The, the, the one we cut down and mounted on here. You can see the wood still here. It's not even stained yet with the wood holding the back on it. And, you know, you have to account for the notches in here. It takes a little bit of work, a little measuring. I'd, I'd recommend a cabinet maker do it for you. If you did it with a table saw, it'd be difficult to get this to fit. But anyways, you measure it two or three times. And um, the, the camera lens that's on the front here, this would have been the film for the speed graphics. This is a two and a quarter by three and a quarter. It's called a miniature speed graphics. I also have one of those. I bought at flea markets, garage sales. If you can't afford this, these now can go anywhere from $250 to $500 to $1,000 to $3,000 for a Takahari Weston. Um, speed graphics are cheap, maybe $100. The lens is maybe $50 or so. KEH.com sells all this stuff. Quality camera repairs it. Your lens doesn't work and the lenses need adjusting. Um, these film holders, um, they, uh, they get old and the film has to be refrigerated. You do black and white, that's what I recommend you're starting with. But here's how it goes. You know, you open up this film holder and then I was in college. You stick the film in here and then you close it and you flip it over and you open it up and stick some more film in here in the dark and close it and then see we're doing things like Ensel Adams did back in the old days you know but we want that look at how large the negative is four inches by five inches you could blow this up to the whole wall of your living room or your dining room or whatever room you wanted we didn't you know want to make small prints we want to make large prints and we want extreme detail and you have to get a light meter handheld light meter so here's another camera we're going to go into really quickly uh, by the way we're standing next to a really cool uh, stereo setup. This is my best stereo system I have in the, in the building. It's a Pioneer turntable with a mag magnetic cartridge here. It's all metal. It's an S-shaped curvature. It has a Audio Technica or uh, maybe a um, very high-end expensive needle on here and a magnetic cartridge. I think it, was, it wasn't Audio Technica. It was probably Pickering. Pickering makes some great stuff. But anyways, this dust cover was not on here. And this Pioneer Tuner from 1976, this was a set together. It was missing the dust cover. Dust covers can be $100 for a dust cover. I took this dust cover off of Techniques, or JCPenney Techniques dust cover, and it fit. So that means JCPenney didn't build the dust covers. So they're interchangeable. And I have hinges back there. And then what I did is I built my set slowly, not expensive because people not really into the older, some people are not into the older stereo equipment, but I am. I love the vintage stuff from 1976-77 because I grew up with it. I'm almost 60 years old. So here we are with stereo speakers, refurbished in Georgia, talking about cameras and talking about why are we using film cameras? Unique. Something different. Anybody can shoot with a digital camera. I can have a, a child learn how to use a digital camera, even a professional digital camera. But it takes a lot of work and a lot of skill to use cameras like this. So, also, going back to the stereo equipment, I love collecting it because I like vinyl records. And um, So I bought the tuner and the turntable for about very low cost. The guy wanted $30 at a garage sale flea market. I talked about $15. The pieces were all disassembled. If you get a stereo turntable and it's Techniques or Pioneer or Kenwood, and it's an older 1976 turntable, you're going to change the belt because the belt's going to be crap. The belt's going to be worn out. You want to make sure that it's got the platter in here. That's the aluminum round thing that spins the record on. Then you want to make sure it has a vinyl mat. Inside the vinyl mat, when you pull it off, it's not stuck with glue or anything. It just sits up. Is your belt turntable. Change the turntable belt. I would highly recommend it. This is probably 
messy with holes and it's falling apart anyways. So I bought this and the guy changed the belt, but he disassembled or the pieces were with the tone arm. So there's a little thing on the back of it called a counterweight. It's round, it looks like like a piece of metal like this, and it has a bolt and nuts on it. And what happened is when I got it, I have not calibrated tone arms. I didn't know how to calibrate it. I'm not an electronics technician. So I went to the internet and I looked up on Google and I Googled how to balance a tone arm. And the average weight on a tone arm was 3.0. So for many weeks I was trying to play records on this turntable, it wouldn't work. And it was all disassembled. Like I said, I had to put the pieces back together. The tone arm, the counterweight on the back was all in three or four different pieces, which made the price lower. I got a great deal, but the question is, what's supposed to be the counterweight set at? So the internet says, I went to Google, somebody on there had an article that said, uh, it was probably on a Stereo Forums website, stereoforum.com or something, Stereo High Fidelity Magazine, and it said, set it at 3.0. I put it on there, I put a record on here, and it played the record, finally. Down here on the bottom is a separate tuner, and a separate amp, a separate receiver. This is an SA model from Pioneer. It's all blue floor scan. It's from Alaska, believe it or not. And the gentleman sold it to me on eBay, Amazon, and gave me a great deal. The shipping wasn't that bad from Alaska or Hawaii, which is usually expensive. But this still works. I'm so happy with this. I'll never sell this. This is my pride and joy with my stereo. I like the silver face Pioneer stuff because I grew up with it when I was a teenager, 18 years old in the 1970s, 1976. So then on the bottom, we got our Pioneer final uh, best cassette player they made back then, because I made copies of my records on cassettes. We didn't have DVD at the time. I was young and 18 years old, 1977. So all we had was vinyl records. We didn't like cassettes, because store-bought cassettes the quality was very poor. It sounded horrible. It was about 5 or $6. It was cheaper than records. But if you're serious about your music, you wanted to be with vinyl records probably got about 500 vinyl records I've collected over the years from uh, thrift stores selling out for a buck, sometimes three or four dollars. A vinyl record is still your best deal because a vinyl record, if it's got a nice needle and a nice magnetic cartridge, it can, the vinyl record can last a long, long time. Um, LP. So this cassette player down here was sold for to me on um, not eBay or Amazon, it was some other, might have been photo.net or some other website, I don't remember. But I bought this Pioneer cassette deck. It had the wood cabinet in it. I took the wood cabinet out because it was kind of beat up, and I just put it in here in this rack. But this is a high-end, probably a $500 to $800 cassette deck made by Pioneer, and it's all blue floor scan. I love it. And if you can find those Pioneer 1976-77, um, they were um, gorgeous. They had reel-to-reel -reel with floor scan, the blue pretty floor scan, replaced the VU meters. I highly recommend buying it because I loved it and it was expensive. I don't have a reel-to-reel -reel right now, but we're working on buying one. I'd love to have a reel-to-reel. -reel. And um, why do you want reel-to-reel? -reel? You can play music for six or eight hours. My dad had one. There was wall and sack, 3M. So anyways, we're gonna jump back to the cameras. We just wanted to show you this setup in here. We also have a TV set over here. This is a JVC that was found thrown away, going to be thrown away, and we salvaged it. There's nothing wrong with the TV. This was a $600, $800 TV set. It's hooked up to a VCR with videotapes, and it's got a microwave on the bottom. The microwave is something like over the head, over the hood range for a microwave, and it's too heavy, I think, to put in the kitchen in here. So, armoire cabinet, chandelier, stereo rack in the middle between, kind of a crowded little room. Another uh, TV set, this is Panasonic. Panasonic, when you go to conventions, you go to trade shows, if you do do that with cameras like PPA.com, uh, which travels around the country, or WPPI camera shows, which is in Las Vegas right now, February 27th to uh, for three or four days. So it's basically a convention, but you can get a free pass to go to WPPI if you're in Las Vegas. February 27th, 28th, 29th, probably ends the 30th, 31st. It's a three-day show. I highly recommend it. It's at the Mandalay Bay for WPPI, which is Wedding Portrait Photographers International in Las Vegas. That's the largest camera show of the country. I went to PPA this year in Atlanta, where I live in Atlanta, and PPA was a little bit of a disappointment to me. Nikon was not there. How could Nikon not show up at a camera show? Canon was there, thank God, but a lot of companies like Smug Mug was not there. Uh, people from... Um, 
the uh, other camera company I wanted to talk to, uh, like, um, let's say, um, Photoflex, they were not there. And there was nobody there, of course, never from Apple Computers, I don't know why, they don't ever come. But it was kind of a small show in Atlanta, even though it was labeled as a big camera show. It was on the radio. It was on 97 One the River, advertised. Anybody wants to come to the PPA photo convention, the World Congress Center, we give you a free badge. Here's the badges that we get when we go to these camera shows. These are the only camera shows they have these days. Camera shows are getting kind of extinct. I'm talking about with old equipment. Here's a camera that I loved when I was 18 years old. I highly recommend it. It's not the same as Hasselblad, but it's called Mamiya. Mamiya RV67 and the Mamiya M series. M is Mamiya 645. This is 120 film. It's 6x7 or 6x9, and you can get a Bessler and larger if you still want to do film and do darkroom. And I will show in another video how to use the enlargers. And we had the Bessler, we had the Omega. Omega made stainless steel tanks, Omega made stainless steel reels. Omega enlargers were superior, Omega enlargers, with rod and stock lenses, or um, they had um, other companies that made the lenses like Nikon, Nikkor sometimes, but rodent stock seemed to be the best with the Omega or Bessler lenses, Bessler enlargers. But anyways, you open up this camera and it has a lens that comes off the front, and this is the Mamiya 645J. I bought $600 in 1979, now you can probably pick these up for two or three hundred dollars, they're cheap because they're film. Film cameras are going down in cost. No light meter inside, all mechanical for the older RV67. This has no electronics in this camera. The Mamiya RV67, you uh, basically put the film, it has a back on the back that attaches to this, which is not in this camera at the moment, or a waist level finder, and it has the body of the camera and the lens. You can pick these up fairly inexpensive. I remember there were three thousand dollars for these cameras, and um, we had a big uh, camera company up in New York. Uh, I think it was called um, Calumet. Calumet was unbelievable catalog, and then you had the B&H catalog, and you had Autorama. Autorama doesn't have a catalog, but if you want to see the world's largest camera store, go to New York City. New York City has always been the place the popular photography magazine. Go to New York and you're going to get a great deal on New York cameras. Uh, other camera stores like 46th Street, uh, when they advertise cameras that are 50% off for a brand new digital camera, Nikon or Canon, I'd be wary of those. Those are black market cameras. And what happens is if you get a serial number with Nikon, and the serial number on this Nikon camera, on your serial number on your booklet, and there's a serial number on the lens and a serial number on the camera body, Certain serial numbers, Nikon authorized dealers will not work on black market cameras. They're called uh, gray market cameras. But anyways, this is the Mimi RV67. I highly recommend it. You always, when you buy a camera like this, the J model, the M645 series, this has been going on since the 1970s. So this camera's been around a long time. The parts are available. There's plenty of people selling used cameras. There's no newer cameras made now. Uh, what's replaced this is basically Mamiya has been bought out by another company and uh, I believe that um, Phase One would be your new kind of ca camera company that would be similar to Mamiya, Phase One. But everything's going to be a digital back under. But who can afford an amateur or semi-professional, can you afford a ten or $20,000 or $50,000 digital back on the back of these cameras? I mean, I'm a part-time photographer, so I'm not going to need something that expensive. I don't need it. I'm going to shoot the 35 SLR Canon or Nikon cameras, which most professionals use, and I'm going to use digital as a 35 millimeter SLR, but I occasionally use film in a wedding. I'll use this. There are wedding photographers still using these cameras. So what's nice about it? There's a lot of safety features in here we're going to talk about quickly because time is running out and this video is going to end. But anyways, I'll do it very fast. In the front of this camera, there's a locking device on here, so you can't accidentally press the shutter. Make sure that's turned to white, not red. Red means it won't work. Uh, it has to be, you have to grab a hold of this handle and cock the shutter. You can hear the mirror go up, and then when I press this button, usually it'll go back down again. If it's turned to red, right now I think it's on red, so I have to turn it 
little red arrow to the white and I push it and um, 